I want to, um, we're going to teach on something today, and the title of it is Roller Coasters, plural, Roller Coasters. Did you, did you guys look at this picture right here? Does that look like Glenn Head right there? That looks like Glenn Head. How many of you think, Glenn, if you're watching online, I believe you were on that roller coaster. But um, thanks to Ben, we were able to get that in there. <laughs> but anyway, you know, when you think about, we like roller coasters because we know the outcome. Are you with me? We know that we're, what if you were to, what if it, there, when you were getting on the roller coaster, there was a sign that said, 50-50 chance. How many, of you, how many of you would just be like, you know what, I'm just going to watch with my, with my iPhone camera, and I'm going to take some pictures of this. How about if it was a 70-30? Anybody get on a roller coaster if it was a 70? How about a 90-10? How about a 99-1? You know, we would just simply say it looks fun, but I'm not getting on that roller coaster. <laughs> and I, I think, you know, when you think about it, We'll take a roller coaster as long as the outcome is predictable. If we can look and say, hey, the track record, the outcome is predictable. I think that if we reflect, we'd agree that life is like a roller coaster. You say, what do you mean? Life is about ups, life is about downs, and then life is just about just you know, just kind of static, going in a particular direction. How many of you know what I'm saying? And if, if you think about it, is that faith in God is what gives us the ability in those highs, in those lows, and when everything is just static, to keep our mind right, to keep our expectation right, and to keep our thinking right. I personally, and I'm, I'm just... I personally don't know how people have come through COVID without trust in God. Be, uh, because it's almost like, how many of you have found there's an expert for every opinion? Yeah. There, there's an expert. If my opinion is this, I can find an expert. If my opinion is this, I can find an expert. And what stabilized me is one, turning news off, and three, praying more. And I want to be educated, but I don't want to be propagandized. How many of you know what I'm saying? I want, and so when you think about it, is that, you, that faith in God or trust in him is what gives us the ability to keep our heart right, our mind right, and our thoughts right when life is on the unpredictableness of a roller coaster. But God wants us to have as much faith that he's leading our lives as when we go onto a roller coaster and we know it's going to turn out well. He wants us to have that much faith that no matter what is going on in our life, it'll turn out well. It, it will turn out well. I want to look at a passage of scripture in in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, and the whole 11th chapter of Hebrews is about all of these people who finished well, but then, and they lived by faith, or they trusted God, and in verse 1, it says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd, speaking of the people in the 11th chapter, of witnesses to the life of faith, or trust, he said, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up, and let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. I want We're going to read verse 2, but what I want you to notice is this, is God said that every one of us has a lane. Every one of us has a race. Your race is different than my race. What God has called you and gifted you to do is very different. We get messed up when we begin to look at other other people that are not us and we want to run their race and have them run our race. How many of you know what I'm saying? But notice what he said is the key word that we must have. He could have said a lot of things, but he said, let us run with endurance the race that has set before us. He didn't say, let us run. And I think we should have joy. I think we should be in love. But he said, let us run with endurance. By God saying, let us run with endurance, what he's telling 
telling us is that we have a lane, he has a plan, but the number one thing we've got to bring to the table is endurance in our life, where we stop and we say, okay, God, I'm just going to stay engaged and I'm going to endure. How many of you have had seasons in your life that you just said, this is an enduring season? How many of you know what I'm saying? How, I won't ask any more questions about that. Verse, verse two says this. It says, we do this, how do we, we do what? We run with endurance the race that God has set before us. And notice God has set it before us. It says, we do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Think about that for a moment. He said, run with endurance. The way we run with endurance is we look to Jesus and we remember that he initiated it and he perfects it or he matures it. And so God knows what's going on in my life, everything that's happening, he initiated and he's perfecting my trust in him. Now look at what it says about Jesus. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Now he is seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. Notice the statement there is we would all agree Jesus was anointed and called by God, every one of us. But what we see very clearly in that verse is it says because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross. That was a roller coaster. That was a, you know, how many of you know you want to be around when God's doing the miracles and multiplying the food and all of that? But the cross thing, that was not something Jesus even said, can I avoid this? Is there any way I can get around this? Not my will, your will be done. And what I want you to notice by this is he compares, he said, run with endurance, keep your eyes on Jesus, and then he talks about Jesus in a roller coaster experience, and then he basically says to us that for the joy that was set before him, he set his focus beyond where he was at. It says that he endured the cross, despising the shame, and then he said this, he said, now he is seated at a place of honor at God's right hand. And that what we've got to realize, roller coasters are just part of it. You know, the great theologian, Forrest Gump. How many of you know who Forrest Gump is? He quoted his mother, who was another theologian, and she said, life is like a box of chocolates. How many of you before have got a box of chocolates and 50% of them are good and the other ones you would have never bought? How many of you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Listen, if you get me chocolates for Christmas, praise the Lord, but I'm just going to tell you straight up, my wife will bite them. And if they're not good, she'll put the other half back for me to finish. And, yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> White the whole bed. Leave it, to, leave it to your husband. How many, you know what I'm saying? He'll eat anything. I mean, okay, we buy, if you buy really good ice cream, you know, like with nuts and all that and caramel, she carves through it and leaves me the vanilla. That's what she does. Okay. But, you know, as we study people, okay, let's just dial it right back in. Notice my wife wants to turn the page on that one really quick. Okay, I get it. Okay. You know, as we study people, um, whether it's in the Bible or in the natural world, whether you look and you study Abraham, you study Isaac, Jacob, Moses, David, Joshua, Caleb, you know, or you jump to the New Testament, Peter, James, John, Paul, or you just look at naturally in people's lives. You, you know, maybe I like to study leaders. I just, I like leadership. I like to study leaders. What you see is in everybody's life is life is about roller coasters. Every single person. Even the Son of God, life is about roller coasters. God never promises us a life without the natural side effect of living down on this earth, which is a fallen world. And he never promises us that we're not going to have roller coaster experiences. Sometimes they're in personal issues. Maybe you're here and it's health related, your personal health. Other times with people, it's relationships. Relationships go through roller coaster type experience. Could be work. You know what I'm saying? If you stop, it could be, it's anything. And, and But what, what, what he does, 
does is he promises to teach us a new way to see them and to go through them that radically, radically affects how that roller coaster affects us and our quality of life. God is not, it, it, I remember that when I was younger, I used to think that if I did everything right and I lived close enough to God, that what he would do is he would just cause me to avoid all of the roller coasters and all of the roller coaster people. How many of you know what I'm saying? If I live close enough to God, he would just cause all of that. And I want to just throw this out. There are times that he does, but then there are times that he wants to develop me while I'm going through it, and that development is linked to what he has for my life tomorrow. And so we have to stop and we have to look and say, you know what, God, no matter what's going on, you want to teach me how to trust you and how to be stable when life is going sideways or up and down. You want me to, like Jesus, have endurance, the joy that is set before. I don't like what I'm going through, but what I know is God's with me and God has got me. We all want God's best for our tomorrow, but we don't like the development process to get there. We're like, God, I want, I want what you said, but we don't like the development. You know, when I was younger, I would rebuke everything in my life that was difficult. And I would use the name of Jesus. How many of you know what I'm saying? Has anybody ever done, anybody kind of, you know what I'm saying? I rebuke that in the name of Jesus. Like, like the Lord's like, well, I'm growing you through it. I still rebuke it. It's uncomfortable. You say, why did you do that? Because I am an American. How many of you know what I'm saying? And the only thing we know about the Bill of Rights is the pursuit of happiness. How many of you know, how many of you know what I'm saying? I was 100% uh, American and 100% biblically naive as to God and what he was doing in my life. You know, when I realized he wanted to use those experiences to develop my faith, the roller coaster changed. My attitude toward the roller coaster changed. But as long as I looked at everything that was difficult, everything that was hard, everything that I didn't want to go through, everything that I felt like was unjust, everything that wasn't fair, everything that wasn't comfortable, as though this isn't fair and this isn't right, it might not be, but I want to tell you, God is going to develop you for what he He's got for your life tomorrow through that situation. He's going he's to develop. We'd all agree that Jesus was equipped by God to do the things he did. Would that be correct? Yeah. We, 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 would all, we would all agree. And to go through the things that he went through. I think we all would. But I want to look at something that it says in Hebrews 5, verse 8 and 9. It says, even though Jesus was God's son, look at these two words, he learned. Now, wait a minute. I thought Jesus knew everything. I thought Jesus just, I mean, there wasn't anything that he didn't know. Well, what did he learn? Obedience from the things he suffered. In this way, God qualified him as the perfect high priest, and he became the source of eternal salvation for all those who obey him. What I want you to notice is this. There are certain things that we can learn from our personal devotion time, from books, from podcasts, from being mentored. There are certain things that we can learn that are not, pers that are not personal, but they're information related. But then there are certain things that we only learn going through things in our life. We only learn it by going through things in our life. How many of you before have been through something and something funky floated up and you said something and you're like, where in the heck did that come from? How many, but you didn't know it before that thing happened. And then when it happened, you were like, whoa, what's the deal? What's going on right there? You know, the Amplified translation says this about um, Hebrews 5, 8, 9. It says his completed experience perfectly equipped him to be the author of salvation. Jesus learned obedience through the things he suffered, equipping him to be what God had called him to do. If God did it with Jesus, why wouldn't he do it with us? If Jesus had to learn things through that, Jesus needed to learn obedience 
through going through things, those things equipped him to be and to do what God had planned, anointed, and gifted him. And it's the same with us. We're no better than Jesus. I wish that I could say that I had this down. I can look at times in my life, and I think all of us, when we go through things in our life, if we don't watch it, we can cop an attitude. If we don't watch it, we can begin to blame everybody. If we don't watch it, we can begin to look at other people's lanes and say, well, they don't have to go through what I have to go through. I wish I could be in their shoes, and they wouldn't respond near like I'm doing. How many of you know what I'm saying? But God is saying, what he's saying is, is he's saying, I want you to understand that you're no better than Jesus. Some things I'm going to cause you to avoid. Other things you're going to go through. But what I want you to do is to learn from it, to develop your trust in me through it. You know, as we come into the Christmas season, Christmas is is the most, if not the second most, religious seasons of the year. Are we in agreement? Easter, Christmas, Christmas, Easter, that kind of a thing. And we all have our traditions as we come into Christmas. We all have our beliefs. We all have our understanding. What if this year God is wanting to do something in our life that is bigger than our autopilot traditional Christmas? What if God is wanting to do something bigger in our life? We've got our autopilot. This is kind of what we do. What if God is, do you know that when Jesus came, everybody was on autopilot? It was just the way things had always gone. And you, you th- if you think about it, one of our Christmas songs that we sing, it's a uh, Christmas carol. Um, how many of you like Christmas carols? How many of you know you can't sing, but you still like Christmas carols? My wife, we used to, we, we used to go, she would, uh, you could tell I need help singing. Are you with me? Don't shake your head. Just look shocked. Like, why? Is, um, is my wife would say, let's go do Christmas carols with the kids. And so we would go do Christmas carols. And then she would come over to me and nudge me and say, honey, could you get to the back and go a little quieter? That's what she would say. In, okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but one of the Christmas songs, Christmas carols that you remember, let every heart prepare him room. Do you remember that? Yes. Let every heart. Yeah. You know, as a, as a team, I believe that as a church, God is blowing on those words as a theme for this Christmas season. For not only whenever God inspires something, we must take it personal to where we're at. Is there an area in your life that God is saying, I want you to prepare me room there. I want you to open up. You know, you think about it. When we study the Bible, what we see is tens of thousands of people came to Jesus. You say, how do you know it was that many? Well, one time we know it says that he fed 5,000 men alone not including women and children. Another time he fed 3,000 men alone, not including, there were times that it says that the crowd was so thick it was pressing and suffocating on him. That was just an example. So we know that Jesus, that tens of thousands of people would come to Jesus, but they were part of the crowd. They would come as part of the crowd. They would come as spectators. They would come as saying, oh, yeah, I'm a traditional, you know, I, oh, yeah, I just kind of want to check this out. And, and, and they, would, they were part of the crowd. We're coming into what I call crowd season in America when it comes to religion. We're coming into a season that people that, that don't normally go to church, they don't know God, but they were raised in a particular bend. And so on Christmas and on Easter, they'll go to a, a Christmas Eve service. They'll go to a Good Friday service. They'll go to a, a, a Sunday before Christmas service. And it's just part of the tradition within their, within their lives. And let me just throw this out. They're part of the crowd. They're part of that crowd. But God, what God's wanting to do is he's wanting us 
to prepare him room in our life to go from maybe a crowd experience to a personal encounter in an area of our life that has maybe been a roller coaster that has disrupted or hindered our faith from going deeper in him. And he's wanting us to come to him that way. You know, when you think about it, is as we, as we say yes in this Christmas season, let's be open to say, Lord, I'm preparing my heart. I'm pr- making room for you in my heart and in my life. I'm open to you. Do you know that in Matthew chapter 11, Jesus was talking to people, and if you, I think the Amplified translation renders it this way, but they were traditionally religious, and that's not bad. That, I'm not saying that in a bad way. It's not bad. They were traditionally religious, and they were coming to him. But Jesus said this to them in Matthew 11, verse 28 through verse 30. Then Jesus said, Come to me, all you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. That sounds like roller coaster stuff. Take my yoke upon you, Let me teach you because I'm humble and gentle in heart and you will find rest for your souls. What I want you to notice is he talked, started talking about weary and carrying heavy burdens. But in the next verse, he talked about, I want to teach you or help you to connect with rest. And I want you to find peace in your soul. Verse 30 says, for my yoke is easy to bear and my burden is light. What I want you to notice, he said, he said, come to me. And then he said, this is what I'm going to give you. How many of you like God to give you things? Jesus said, I'm going to give you something. This is what I'm going to give you. Jesus came to those who knew that they needed help. He didn't come to the ones who thought they had it all together. He, knew, he came to the ones who knew that they needed help in their life. If you want to connect with God in this season, come to him from a place of, Lord, I need your help. God, I need your help in my life. If you think about it, is the ones, if you look at this, the ones that received in the Bible, they were the ones that came to him and they cried out. They said, I'm in need. I have a need here. This is my specific need. And I want to just tell you this. There is no need that is too small for God. And then on the other spectrum, there is no need that is too big for God. What God wants us to know him as a loving father that deeply cares and wants to be actively involved in our life where there is a trust and a faith in him. And so what I'm going to just give you, if I could, five thoughts from this verse and then two reflection points. You said that's seven. Put on your track shoes. Get ready. Number one is this, is there's a difference between coming to him and coming to him with an open heart. There's a big difference between the two. These people had already come. They had already come, but Jesus, he he immediately began to address the condition of the heart. God sees when I come, but he really sees when I come and my heart is open to him. And I'm saying, God, I'm open to you. Open meaning, God, I'm hungry for you in my life. And I would venture to say right now that each and every one of us to maybe look at an area that has been a roller coaster experience. And we do good as long as it stays in this lane. But the moment it's starts messing over here, we have a tendency to doubt God, to question God, to grab hold of the steering wheel, and to do it our way. And God is saying, I want you to be open to prepare me room now in that area of your heart and in that area of your life. Number two is this, is God has a greater level of peace and rest than what I'm currently experiencing. He's got a greater level. You say, I'm close with God. This is what I know about God. We are only scratching the surface of the depth of his peace and rest that he has for us. This is what I know. When we're at peace, we can go through anything. When we're resting in him, we can go through anything. And what I have found out about peace is this, is it's all in rest. It's almost like when the Bible describes Moses in the wilderness and God rained down manna every single day 
today. And he said, you go out and I'm going to give you enough for today. You remember Jesus' prayer? Give us this day our daily bread. God every day has a new dose of peace, has a new dose of rest, but we got to push into him to get that in our life. I didn't say you didn't know God's peace in his rest, but he has more than what I've ever experienced. God has more. There's a deeper peace and a deeper rest than what I could currently know, and he wants to reveal it. Is my religious box in understanding limiting him in my life? Where I've got this box, I've got this is where it's at. It often takes roller coaster experiences to reveal it in our life. Where we go through something, and we look, and we're like, okay, I see that now. Number three is this. I'm in charge of what I'm yoked to, and that's no yoke. No, I'm kidding. I, mean, I wasn't in my. <laughs> I said, say it with me. Say, I'm in, I'm in charge of what I'm yoked to. Have you ever complained to God about your schedule? Let's just be honest. You know, God, my, oh my. God. God's like, you're in charge of your schedule. Well, not really. He's like, you're in charge. Your will is in charge of what you carry. And you think about it. Is Jesus said, take my yoke upon you. Who does the taking? I do. We just want God to just kind of, how many of you, God's like, no, you take my yoke upon you. You know, when you look at this word yoke, and I'm sure some of us, many of us, have heard people share about this, you know, the yoke of oxen and that whole thing. And I remember when I was a kid, a preacher getting up there, and he even had a yoke, put the yoke on and, you know, kind of, is number one is when you look at the, when you talk about Jesus saying, take my yoke upon you, is yoke is twofold. The first is two oxen joined together. So I am the one that joins myself to him. I am the one that says, Lord, okay, I'm going to join. But in, it's a picture of two ox moving in the same direction. But then equally, if you study Jewish history, is it is a rabbinical term or a term that the rabbis would use. And the rabbinical term, the meaning of it was to take upon ourselves the teaching of a rabbi, to take it on, to own it, and it to become part of our life. And you can clearly see by the next verses, this is what Jesus was meaning because he said, learn of me. But a, So when we talk about being yoked, it's me. He's saying, Lord, I realize that right now I need to join myself to you and I need to take your teaching, your word, and your ways and own them in my life so much so that they begin to affect how I see life, how I go through life, and the way that I do. Number four is this, is humility and tenderheartedness is the garden that grows God's peace and refreshing. Humility and tenderhearted. How many of you know, or I hope, we're not, we, we cannot just get set in our ways, especially if they're broken. How many of you know what I'm saying? We cannot get, you say, well, why not? Because now you're just in survival mode. You're just in, we cannot, we have to stop and say, Lord, I'm humble and I'm I have a, I'm tender hearted because I realize that I'm going to experience your peace and your refreshing. Proverbs 22, four says this true humility and the fear of the Lord. It leads somewhere. It leads to riches, honor, and a long life. Think about that statement. God says that if I'll cultivate an attitude of humility and fear of the Lord or a reverence for him, God, your ways are right. I know your ways are right. I don't have them all down, but I come to you and I'm asking you to help me. God said, I just want to let you know that is going to lead you to a place of riches, honor, and a long life. See, many times God's way up is down first, where we have to say, God, I'm just, I'm, I realize and I'm open. Never allow anything to replace humility and tenderheartedness. Number five is this, is God's rest and refreshing is a way of life that is independent of circumstances. You say, wait a minute, 
What do you mean? Independent of circumstances. I'm going to say this again. God's rest and refreshing is a way of life that is independent of circumstances. That just causes our brain to go poof. How many of you know what I'm saying? Wait, I can have rest? Oh my gosh, I can have refreshing independent of my circumstances in my life. Notice Jesus talked to them about rest and refreshing, but it was in the context of being joined to him and applying his teaching in their lives. Not when their circumstances changed, but right now. Right at that moment is when Jesus began to speak to them. Throughout the Bible, God promises to meet our needs. That is not a question. I don't think we should ever question. I'm not saying God doesn't want to meet our need. But God wants to change our circumstances, but he doesn't want our circumstances controlling our connection with him and our rest and our refreshing in him. Yes, God cares about where you're at. Yes, God cares about your circumstances. Yes, God cares about what you're suffering. Yes, Yes, God cares about where you're at. But what he doesn't want is your refreshing and your rest to be controlled by waiting for that circumstance to change when he said, I'm going to teach you how to be in perfect peace and rest and trust even before the circumstances ever change in your life. And what God does is he comes in. We're so, it's so hard for us because we're used to functioning on a different level. This natural world down here is when everybody's nice to me. How many of you know we're coming into in-law season? How many of you know what I'm saying? Let's just be honest. Honest moment. Everybody online, maybe you're watching with Thanksgiving, but you're coming into in-law season. How many of you know what I'm saying? You can't let your in-laws determine your level of peace and rest. Thank you. I I appreciate it, Preston. It's like, oh my gosh. They're coming. coming. I'm going in the backyard. (laughs) You know, and we have to be able to stop and say, okay, God, I I know that you want to change my circumstances. And I have been blaming my lack of peace and my lack of rest on something outside. And what you're saying is you want to teach me how to live at peace and how to have rest, and how to have fresh, refreshing, no matter what's going on in my life. Oh my gosh, I want that. How many of you think that if Moderna came out with a pill that did that, it would surpass all COVID sales? How many of you know what I'm saying? It would just be like, oh, forget, I just, you know what I'm saying? It would surpass. Two very quick reflection questions. You say, what is a reflection question? A reflection question is something that you stop and you ask yourself, and it's more of a prayer point for this week, where you begin to say, Lord, and this is number one, is there an area that I need to prepare him room? Right now in your life. So I realize I've got this area, this situation, maybe this relationship, this circumstance, this belief system, because of what I've been through or because of what I face, that, Lord, I've really not been believing. And I kind of just grab the steering wheel when I get in that situation. And you're saying to me, you want me to prepare you room. There's no greater time to hit restart than around Christmas time. No greater time. Maybe God is asking you right now, it's time for a restart. Maybe God's asking you right now, it's time to stop rehearsing and it's time to start believing. Is God saying to you maybe right now, you know what, I realize that I need to hit a restart right now in my heart and in my life in this area. Number two is this, am I open to humility and tenderheartedness in an area that I don't like? God, I'm open, I'm open. You know, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close with this story. Um, I love Africa. And, you know, I don't know if you uh, know, but they're closing to Africa down again new to some, due to some new variant and everything like that. But I have a lot of friends in different parts, different countries in Africa. 
And um, one of my good friends is Robert. And Robert is, um, his name is um, Robert Muhumuza. I know all of his kids. I know his wife stayed at his house, all that kind of stuff. And he, he's a pastor there, and he's been a pastor since the reign of Idi Amin, when it was underground. You didn't sleep in your house because the soldiers would come by and look for lights on in houses and then they'd kick the door in and steal everything. And so you slept out in the, in the, in the woods and then in the day you came back into your house. But um, we always, we go and, and do pastor's conferences and do different things there. And, um, and I always liked to, Robert had an orphanage and he had about, I probably had about 150 kids that their parents had all died of AIDS. And so he started a school and it was a, a basically he would, uh, they would go to school and they had a place to live. And uh, he didn't, he didn't intentionally start this, but people were just dropping their kids off and he would open the gates of his church and there would be a baby there, two babies there. And so he would take them in. And I remember we would always go with the kids and we just love the kids. We'd bring things and stuff, but I would always try to think, And I would say, um, I would think, gosh, what could I bring that I know that they would never be able to get where they're at? And one year, I decided that I was going to bring s'mores to Uganda. You say, what do you mean s'mores? How many of you know what a s'more is? How many of you know s'mores are from Jesus? How many of you are with me on that? And so I said, okay, we're going to bring graham crackers. We're going to bring chocolate. And we're going to bring... marshmallows. And we filled up one suitcase full of that. Just one suitcase was just full of that. And we got there and, um, and they were just like, oh my gosh, they'd never had chocolate in their life, never had a marshmallow in their life, never had any of this stuff in their life. And Robert's um, mother-in-law, his wife, Joy's mother was like 83 years old, didn't speak any English. And we we're all around the campfire at his house. And we're all around the campfire and she was about this tall, little sweet lady. And she was just watching all of us. She couldn't communicate, couldn't understand anything. And I looked over at her and I thought, I wanna give her a s'more. And um, so I made a s'more and I carried it over and I handed it to her and she looked at it. She smiled really big. She only had about three teeth, but she smiled really, really big. And she took a bite of it and she pulled it away from her mouth, and she said something in Ugandan. And I said, Robert, what did she say? He said, she said, this is what heaven must taste like. That's what she said. She said she never had any of the ingredients, but she had to say, I'm gonna eat that before she could experience what heaven tasted like. I believe that as we prepare him room, God is saying, I want to show you what heaven tastes like in that area, in that area, in that area. But we are the only ones that can say, okay, Lord, I'll eat that. Okay, Lord, I'll taste that. Okay, Lord, I want that. Amen. Amen. Stand to your feet if you would. God, today, Lord, just talking about the natural world and roller coasters. Lord, it just strikes, we look at Jesus, we look at Abraham, we look at David, we look at Paul, Peter, James, John. And what we clearly see is that the experience down here is like a roller coaster. You are not going to exempt us from it. You are not going to take us out of it, but you're going to grow us through it. And Lord, just like Jesus, what we see is you said that he learned obedience through the things that he suffered. Lord, we can learn a lot cerebrally But going through roller coaster experiences and choosing to have an honoring heart, trusting and believing you will develop us for what you have for our life tomorrow. Lord, I believe that there's many of us that are here today that have dreams in our heart. And Lord, maybe we've 
gotten this American gospel of it should be comfortable, it should be easy, it shouldn't be challenging, it shouldn't be difficult, and if it is, I'm going to run. I'm going to hide. I'm, I'm going to rebuke it. But today, what you're saying to each and every one of us is that life is like a roller coaster, or like Forrest said, like a box of chocolates. And you're wanting each and every one of us in this Christmas season to prepare you room. Say that with me. Say, Lord, help me. Help me, God, to not give in to reflex when my roller coaster doesn't do what I want. Help me, God, to stay humble, tender-hearted, and to prepare you room. Jesus' name. Just with every head bowed and every eye closed, you're here today and you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life. You've never come to a spot where you've said, Lord, I give you my life. I give you my heart. This can't be because of anybody around you, boyfriend, girlfriend, husband or wife, parents. But you've not come to the spot where you've said, you know what, I'm just... Super sick and tired of living this way. There's got to be more. And today I, I need Jesus. And I want to give him my heart. I want to give him my life. And I want him to go from the outside. I want to go from the crowd to somebody who's closer. You're here and I want to pray for you right where you're at. We're all going to pray together. But I believe that as the Holy Spirit is stirring you, He's wanting you to respond to Him. You say, what do you mean by respond? On the count of three, I want you to just lift your hand. That's coming out of the natural comfort level to say, yes, God. That's you. One, two, three. Lift your hand to the Lord. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I want to lead us all in this prayer. Say this with me. Jesus, I believe that you're God's son. That you gave your life because you love me. I need you. And today, I choose you. I'm asking you, forgive me of my sins. Come into my life. Help me, God. I give you my heart and the rest of my life. In Jesus' name, amen.